A common question in OpenStack class is how do I physically wire the OpenStack node itself? Turns out that's a really good question. So you do the Google searches, but it doesn't really yield a practical solution, does it? You, you look out there and there's some really nice diagrams, but none of them really gives you a practical explanation. Let's take care of that. The actual physical connectivity of an OpenStack node or host can actually be explained in five steps. First, I'll show you the physical wiring. You only need two physical interfaces. In reality, you only need one, but we're gonna use two because we're gonna use ethernet bonding. Ethernet bonding doubles the speed and it gives us reliability in case one of the two cables gets unplugged. That's why we need two. Step three is we'll explain ethernet tagging. That's why we only need two interfaces. Step four will explain Linux network function virtualization and the things that you have to configure. These are the things that OpenStack will not help you. You have to put this part in place. And then lastly, I'll tie it all together with a single diagram. Step one is the physical wiring. So you take a compute node or a controller we're only going to need two Ethernet cables. It couldn't be simpler. Run the two Ethernet cables from the Ethernet switch up to the node or the host itself, just like you see here. Step two involves bonding. This is why we want two cables. At each end, we want to bond the ends and configure them for bond mode four. So the official spec is 802.3 AD. This is an active-active mechanism, which means if you unplug one cable, the other one takes over, but if they're both plugged in, they both work. So aggregate traffic balances on both of the cables. Individual flows, however, do not balance. This is a caveat. Any individual flow will always stick to one of those two cables, so no flow will ever exceed the speed of one of those cables. But the aggregate flow will spread evenly across both of them. If any connection fails, you can expect a failover from one of the active cables to the other in about 100 milliseconds. Now, the configuration of the bonding on the Ethernet switch is left to you. The configuration of the bonding in the Linux server I'm going to show you here. We're going to create a new physical interface. I know, air quotes, physical. It's hardly physical. I know it's logical, but this is the way we talk. So that bond zero interface is going to be a physical interface to create it in a snippet that I'm taking from a Debian style Etsy network interfaces, I create the interface called Bonzu and I make sure I repeat it here and set it for manual. And then we're going to specify two bond slaves that you'll see right here, where I actually didn't put Ethernet zero right here because in modern Linux kernels, you never really know the name of these. Uh, so I actually took this from one of our Ansible playbooks. So everything inside of these double braces right here, you would replace that with whatever names of these interfaces, uh, would, would, whatever that would be, that's what you would replace there. Always set up in bond zero, bond slaves none, and then specify the actual bonding of the interfaces down below. This worked cleanly, reliably every single time. From here on out, this bond zero interface, which we will consider a physical interface, will appear as though it were connected with a single cable to the external ethernet switch. Step three is VLAN. There's gonna be four slides on this one. First of all, on the ethernet switch side, we have to configure the ethernet switch's bonded interface as a VLAN trunk. So remember, those two interfaces on the switch are bonded. That creates a logical interface on the switch side as well. And you wanna make that interface a trunk. Allow all VLAN traffic to pass through there that the host is going to require. If you block any VLANs here that the host is going to need, you've just turned those VLANs off. Enable all the VLANs that will need it up above. So before we get into the details of this next slide, let's understand that the connectivity from bond zero to the ethernet switch appears as a single VLAN trunk. So we're not so much concerned of that ethernet zero and ethernet one interface anymore. We're taking a look at bond zero. 
And in this particular case, we're going to create a new interface and the naming of these interfaces could not be simpler. If you want, for instance, to pick up VLAN tag 1600, the name the interface, bond zero, you don't get any choice there, whatever you named this interface, the sub interface must take that name, and then you do a dot 1600. I will say that if you choose to actually name this some strange name like management, you, you can, but I, I think you wind up uh, making it difficult down the road. So I stick with this convention. I just think it makes it a lot easier. As a result of doing this, the moment we create a bond 0.1600 interface, any traffic for VLAN 1600 is going to be sent this way. And when traffic passes through the bond 0.1600 interface, the traffic is untagged. So it's untagged or like access on this side, and this side would appear like a trunk, but only for VLAN 1600. Do the same thing in this particular case for VLAN 1200 or whatever the VLAN would be, for instance, for your provider network. I'm going to directly connect to bond zero with other services. That will be a trunk. VLAN tags will persist in that case. While I talk about this, please remember bond zero is an interface. It's not an Ethernet switch. So what we've just done now is actually we've created three interfaces. And right here is the configuration. Stop the video if you want to actually study that the way I have it set up. So now we have three physical interfaces. And of course, I air quote the physical because uh, the OpenStack architecture and all the diagrams and everything that they explain will call these physical interfaces. So we adapt ourselves to that. And the way we have it set up, because this blue interface is a sub interface, I will see untagged VLAN 1600 traffic here. This is a VLAN trunk because there is no sub interface. And we have untagged traffic over here in this case for VLAN 1200. One, two, three. Great, we've just created three interfaces that were on top of a single bonded interface. Now, a word to the wise on VLAN traffic flow. Please be aware that any traffic for VLAN 1600 is going to go this way. That would even apply that if traffic's coming down, uh, tag VLAN 1600, it's going to go that way. So sub interfaces will hog their VLAN. All you have to do keep yourself out of trouble, continue to remind yourself that this bond zero interface is the termination of a trunk. It's an interface. It's not a switch. And that takes care of VLAN. Now, our next step is to add network function virtualization. I'm going to use open vSwitch switches. So we're going to create a switch named bridge management, and we do it with this configuration right here. That will actually create that bridge right out of thin air. The next step in order to effectively plug it in to bond 0, 1600 is the next step that you see right here. Uh, and now I have literally wired in a bridge named bridge management to bond 0, 1600. Since untagged traffic is coming into bridge management, any connectivity off of bridge management is going to be untagged. We're going to do the same thing with this green stuff over here on bridge external. Uh, in this case, just connecting into the BR or bond 0.1200, exact same process. Last but not least, we're going to create bridge VLAN. That's the red part right there. And we're going to connect this directly to bond 0. Now, because bond 0 is a trunk, this is going to be tagged traffic. So we see a trunk going to be our VLAN and we see untagged traffic on the blue and the green. So now we have our bridges in place and we're ready to start connecting things. In step five, I promised that I would tie it all together for you in a single diagram, so here it is. What we've described so far is the creation of this part. Uh, a very confusing thing for students because I don't think it's explained very clearly out there. This is the part that you put in place on your own. And of course, there's no limit to how many sub interfaces and other bridges you could create if you'd want to. OpenStack is going to be pretty insistent on creating the integration bridge. 
And in the any files, it probably will make sense now that when you configure these in the ML2 uh, configuration, for instance, you'll see that connectivity. This is stuff that we actually go in detail in the class. Now, another thing that I do when I deploy OpenStack is that I always deploy the OpenStack services in their own container. And in reality, MySQL and MongoDB and RabbitMQ and Keystone, I actually put each one of them in a separate container. However, uh, this slide got so incredibly busy, I decided it might be better to dumb this down a little bit and, and show you maybe a more minimal configuration. So I create one container, and it's very easy to do, and I actually launch all of these services inside of there and then connect it up with a piece of network function virtualization known as a VETH. I put the networking services or Neutron in its own container, but since that's Neutron, not only does it need access to the management network, it also needs access to the VLANs, Bridge External, and um, if we had time, we could talk about GRE and uh, VXLAN, uh, which could also be involved in this picture. And if it were, uh, very likely there would be extra VEATHs that would be coming out of the networking interface. Um, I'd like to put uh, the dashboard in its own uh, container as well. Uh, in fact, sometimes splitting Horizon uh, out, out from Apache since they both step on port 5000. So um, th there you have it. Uh, this is what OpenStack refers to as the physical component, the part that you get to put in for every single node that you deploy, and then you put the OpenStack stuff on top of it. This completes the first of a four-part series. Go ahead and click on item number two right there, which will take you to network function virtualization, ultimately finishing up with the hands-on lab at the very end.